it's going to be. I'm going to enjoy that. I'm going to enjoy being a part of that. But I'll tell you something else I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to enjoy seeing some of you other sophisticated folks come unglued. <laughs> some of you, you're afraid to even raise your hand and say glory. And when you get there, I can promise you, what a wonderful day that'll be when all the, the, the flesh and all those things are gone and we're just not inhibited by what we think somebody else is going to think about us and that we give him glory and, and praise to his precious name. Well, we're going to go to Isaiah 64 this morning for a few moments. Uh, I want you to find that chapter and then uh, look up here for just a minute uh, and uh, I'll make some opening comments and then we'll read this passage of scripture. My message this morning uh, is entitled Revival is When God Shows Up. We use that term revival uh, and, I, and I fear a lot of times we don't even know what we're talking about. Folks have all kinds of ideas about what revival really involves and this chapter I think details for us in a very vivid, picturesque way in the Word of God uh, what revival is all about and it's all about God showing up in our midst. I believe the majority of those uh, in this room this morning and probably many of those who will be watching the video of this service today would say that we desperately need revival in our churches in America today. Our homes need revival. They are in disarray. Our churches need revival. We are literally suffocating from a lack of God's presence. Our nation Above all of the things that we might list as needs in America this morning, what our nation really needs is an old-fashioned, sin-killing revival among the people of God. I will say this morning, and I am by no means a prophet. I've never conceived of myself of being in that vein of things. I, I don't have any extra foresight from what I read in God's Word, but I, I believe this morning that Aside from a real revival in America, we are actually living in the twilight time of this country. I believe that with all my heart. The tr traditional Bible family is under relentless attack from every direction you look today. Organizations like Planned Parenthood, with their millions and millions of dollars, organizations like Antifa, and Black Lives Matter, oh, you say, preacher, that's political. I, well, I just mark it down wherever you want to mark it down. All of those people stand against the traditional Bible family in America today and against the church and against God's people. In fact, if you had time and would take the time to research what those people promote, and what they use as a, as, a, as a program for what they are doing, you would find that most of them believe that the enemy of this nation today is sitting right here in this congregation. And that doesn't have anything in the world to do with the color of your skin, but it has to do with the color of men's hearts. Our freedom to worship our God according to the teachings of the Bible is under attack. We see this attack manifested in the continuing unrest, the, the rioting, the looting, the killing in the streets of our cities. All you say, no, preacher, all this is going on right now is over those policemen killing that poor black man uh, uh, up in Minneapolis. Listen, that was a terrible thing. It was an awful thing. I mean, to watch that is, it was heartrending. But I want to tell you what's going on in America. Don't have a thing in the world to do with that poor black man doing what happened to him. It has to, it has to do with an attack on the very fiber and the fabric of this nation and what has made this nation the great nation that it is. The looting, the killing on the streets of our cities, all of it being fanned by, by a leftist socialist media and by the socialist politicians in our country. Uh, we, we, see, we see the attempts of that to, uh, ongoing as they are now trying to defund and destroy our police departments. We cannot live in a nation where there are no laws. 
You cannot, a, a, a nation and, uh, cannot exist unless there is a judicial system. There must be law, sure. As long as man is in this mortal state, there will always be improvements to be made. By the way, there are improvements that need to be made in your life and my life this morning, just as there are improvements that need to be made in the lives of those men who are serving as policemen. I make it a point whenever I come across a military man to stop and tell him I appreciate his service for our nation. But I also make it a point today, whenever I see a policeman, wherever I'm at, I go to him and if I have opportunity and say to him, I, police, I appreciate your service to our country and what you do. One of, the, one of two things is going to happen in America. One of two. If we don't have revival, we'll have ruin. That's exactly where we're sitting this morning. I want to remind you that no military power can bring about revival. There is no economic upturn that can bring revival. Though elections are important, I can tell you the election in November will not bring about revival in America. Revival is a sovereign work of Almighty God. With that being said, let me give you the setting of the verses that we're going to read in just a moment. God's people here. Isaiah has been writing to them and they have been carried away into captivity and God's work is in disrepair. The city is in ruin. The people are dispirited. Much like so many in the 21st century church today. You see, unannounced, almost unnoticed, the church of our day, like God's people of old, has been carried away into captivity. That captivity has been engineered by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I look around this morning and, and many, many Christians are discouraged and, and, and many in, almost in despair over where things are and the condition that we're living in. In fact, uh, many have no hope even for revival today. I, I, I talk to church folks, saved folks. Many of them have been saved years and years and years. And, and uh, as you listen to them talk, there is no hope for revival whatsoever. Their position this morning is simply this. Hold the fort. Jesus is coming. They don't even believe that revival is possible in the hour that we're living in. I will not stand here and tell you this morning that I know that, that a worldwide revival is possible. In fact, I won't even stand here and tell you that I know that a countrywide revival is, uh, uh, could take place in America. But what I will tell you, that the only thing that keeps you and I from having personal revival in our lives is what's inside your skin this morning, who you are. And I want to say loudly and strongly this morning, revival is not only possible, but it is inevitable when God's people get serious about getting right with God. Let me ask you the question this morning, why is there no revival? We, we can't say there's no revival because of the dis, disunity of God's people. There's always been disunity among God's people. We can't say there's no revival because we haven't been evangelistic. We, we can't say there's no revival because God's people have been worldly and compromising. We, we can't say there's no revival because there's liberalism in the church. The, the fact is you can remove all those things. Every one of those things could be straightened out and it still would not be revival. You can, you can get all those things wiped away, but that still does not mean there's revival. The fact is, those things are a result of no revival among God's people. And that brings us back to where we started this morning. What is revival? Isaiah tells us what it is right here in this chapter. Revival is when God comes down. Notice our text, Isaiah 64, beginning in verse 1. Literally, it is a prayer of the heart of the prophet. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens... That thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. 
When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art raw, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are all the work of thine hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise these burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Would you pray with me, Father? Thank you for the reading of the word of God. Thank you, Father, for the truth that's here this morning. A truth that was very evident in Isaiah's day and a truth that's very evident in the hour that we live. The children of Israel needed the presence of God. We need the presence of God in, in, in such a way this morning. I pray for liberty now to preach what you put on my heart this morning. And I pray for liberty for the Spirit of God to work in the hearts of those who are seated in this room this morning. Sometimes we get in our minds that in order for revival to come, you've got to have a large crowd that gets moved by God. And yet as we look in days past, when you moved in, when you came, it wasn't necessarily a crowd. It was to one here, to one there, to a few in this place or a few in that place. It's the Spirit of God came and the power of God was evidenced. And we beg you for that this morning. Forgive us of our iniquities. Help us to see ourselves in the light and truth of your word as we are covered with our filthy rags, fading as a leaf in the autumn sun. And realize, Lord, how desperately we need you. Touch us by your mighty power this morning. We'll praise and thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These verses reveal to us what revival is all about. Our God coming down. It is a meeting with Almighty God. I fear sometimes that for some of us, our desire for revival only involves seeking for God to do something. God, would you do this? God, would you do that? And really, uh, Lord, I need you to do this for our church's sake. I, I need you to do this for our family's sake. Would you, would, you, would you come and do this for our nation's sake? But the problem in, in that is that we are seeking God's hand and we're not seeking God's face. What we desperately need in this hour among God's people is a seeking of the face of God. Our hearts, our very beings need to, need to cry out, need to yearn for God as did the heart of the prophet here in our text. Oh God, will you come down? Oh that thou wouldest rend the heavens that thou wouldest come down. That ought to be the cry of our hearts this morning. I have to tell you, as I stand here and look back across this congregation this morning, my heart grieves as I look back and I know that without a doubt, probably only those who are well on in years as far as age is concerned have ever been in a place where God really came down. I mean in the church service where the, the evidence, presence, and power of God came down. 
I think about our young people, precious young people that are seated mostly on this side uh, of the church. I, I think about Justin and Savannah and I see Aiden and, and uh, uh, Adeline and, and uh, uh, others that are seated here. And then I see some young people who are seated here this morning. And, and, and it grieves my heart this morning that most of them have never been a place where God came down in a manifest way. They, they know nothing of, of the real power and presence of God. And I think in my heart, is it any wonder that our young people are leaving our churches by droves today? Why? Because they're seeking, they're, they're seeking something that has a semblance of life. They are looking for something that has some life about it, something that is not cold, something that is not just manufactured, something that is not just a ritual or a habit in, in somebody's life. And they're, they're going to religious centers today where men have perfected worldly methods to create emotional stirrings that have nothing to do with the real presence of God. And the sad thing is that after a time, all of that's going to wear thin because there's no reality there. You can work on emotion for a little while, but I can promise you emotion won't carry you far. I've stood in this pulpit for over 35 years preaching the Word of God. There have been numerous times I have had couples in that, in that altar, in that altar, husbands and wives, crying out to God over problems they were in, emotionally moved to come and cry. I've watched it as, as, as people who had alcohol problems, people who had drug problems, broken over their need, came emotionally moved, and they came to these altars weeping and crying, just, just pouring their hearts out, and, and get up from that altar and go out the back doors and... and, and uh, Moving on emotion. They, they are moving forward on emotion, but, but emotion won't carry you far. If there's no reality of the presence of God in your life, it won't get you back out there in life and take care of you as you need taken care of. I've watched some of those couples in a short period of time winding up. Their marriage is going that way. I've watched some of those folks with drug problems and alcohol problems go back out of here in less than a week or two weeks' time back in the same place they were in when they came to the altar. Can I tell you this morning, there's no help for you and there's no help for me in our emotions. It's going to have to be God or there's going to be no help there at all. And my heart cries this morning as did the heart of the prophet, oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down. As I look into this chapter, I see some very essential things presented let me point out three things to you quickly this morning. First of all, there's the presence that brings revival. Isaiah talks about that in, in verses 1 through 5. The presence that produces revival is God himself. Isaiah gives us some evidences of God coming down in these first five verses. In verse 2, he tells us that mountains will melt. Look at it, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As uh, when the melting fire burneth the fire, causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Now, is he talking about physical mountains here? I, I remember my first experience uh, in Costa Rica going out with Bobby to the, uh, the active volcano where they have a tourist area. And uh, we, we went out it's a, lo a long way from where we were with him in the church. And we took a, a couple of days to go out there. And uh, I'd never been where there was an active volcano before. And uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, the first day we got there, you couldn't even see the top of the mountain. The clouds were down over it. And uh, there, there was some... And now and then you could see a little extra smoke billowing, but now and then you could hear a rumbling. And uh, there were times that uh, I, I remember one morning I woke up and at about 5 o'clock, the whole bed I was laying on was shaking. I thought, what in the world's going on? I, I thought somebody had slipped in the room and they're shaking my bed, but it wasn't. It was an earthquake around that, around that volcano. And those earthquakes are common around those uh, volcanoes. 
Then the next day it was clear and you could see, you could see where the mountain was belching out fire. Now, we didn't have an explosion or anything, but rolled down the back side of the mountain where most of it blew out. And the entire side of that mountain that had at one time been covered by villages where people had built their homes and they had, uh, they had their, uh, their, their animals, they, they had their little farms and whatever. When that thing blew up, that whole mountain melted. It belched out and it just, it just ran down that. Is that what Isaiah is talking about? No. That's not what he's talking about here. I have no doubt this morning that the fiery presence of God, if he so desired, God could speak and the entire end of Lookout Mountain that overshadows us this morning would literally melt down. I believe we serve a God that's that powerful this morning. But Isaiah's not talking about here. When I look at these verses, I believe he's talking about the mountainous things in our lives that separate and shut his presence away from us. Mountains of sin, mountains of pride, mountains of bigotry, mountains of indifference in our lives. All of these things are obstacles to God's work. But when he comes down, they'll melt away. It is God's presence. It is God among us that deals with those things in our lives. Hear me this morning. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that, that can stop the revival fire of Almighty God. When God comes down, it burns the dross out of lives. Why do we need revival? This morning. We need it so that God would perfect himself in us, among us as the people of God today. When God comes down, mountains will melt. I wonder this morning, are you really seeking for him to come down? Is that what you're really concerned about or are you just kind of trouble living under the stress you're in? Do you really want God to show up? Do you really want God to come down? You, you see, if, if he comes down, he's going to deal with me. He's going to deal with you. I, you may have more sin than I have. I may have more than you have. But I promise you, when God comes in our midst, he's not coming at, he's not coming at, 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 my, at my desire to work in you. He's coming to work in all of us. His will, his desire. Secondly, Isaiah says, when God comes down, sinners will shake. Look at the last part of verse 2. To make thy name known to thine adversaries that the mountains may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down. He's talking here about the people of God. Not the people of God, but their adversaries. He's not talking about what he's going to do in the lives of God's people, but he's talking about what he's going to do among their adversaries, among those who are enemies to God. You, you see, one of the real problems in our society today is there no conviction of sin. Absolutely no conviction of sin. Lost people don't have any conviction of sin. And the reason for that is because most of God's people are living right where they're living, doing the same things they're doing, and they see no difference in the life of that one who goes to church and that one who doesn't go to church. We're living in an hour when there's a major absence among sinners of convicting power. No conviction, no conversion. You don't, you don't get saved by just praying a little one, two, three prayer. You, don't, you can memorize the prayer, but that doesn't save you. When God convicts a person of their sin, they're going to repent of their sin and turn from it. Amen. Now ask, the, ask yourself the question this morning, how long has it been since you heard an unsaved person cry out to God for mercy in their lives? It's a long time back, friend. When God comes down, Isaiah says mountains will melt, sinners will shake. But then thirdly, the, the righteous will rejoice. Look at verses, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee. What he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy, in, in thy ways. The wondrous truth this morning is that God wants to meet with you. That, that's an amazing thing, that God would want to meet with us. God wants to meet with you. He wants to come down. He wants to be in our midst. And when He does, He'll produce real rejoicing, real joy unspeakable and full of glory. When, when the Lord is present, church will not be something that bores you. Uh, years ago, I heard Zig Ziglar speak in a meeting. Ziglar was a, was a motivational speaker, but he was quite a Christian, a very, very committed Christian. 
and he was speaking to a church group of people. And uh, in, his, uh, in his teaching, he asked the question, how many of you have ever been in a boring worship service? And uh, he said, now I want you to be real honest with me. How many of you have ever been in a boring worship service? Well, there were a number of hands went up, several hundred people in attendance there. And then he said, all right, take your hands down. Now he said, I want to tell you, no, you've been in a boring church service. You've never been in a boring worship service. <laughs> Because to worship, you've got to get in the presence of God. And to get in the presence of God takes away the bore in this whole thing. I'll tell you this morning, most of the time there's no worship in God's house because we come unprepared to worship. We don't, we don't come ready to meet our God. We've got everything in the world going on in our minds and we don't take time to even slow down to prepare our hearts to come into the house of God. This morning, I want to tell you, I, I long to see that among God's people. Do you? I long to see that. I want my children to see that. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren to see that. I want God to meet with His people. I, 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 I want to know this incredible joy of being in the presence of God. So we look here in Isaiah's writing, and we see, first of all, the presence of that produces revival, God himself. But then I want you to notice, secondly, the problems that prevent revival. What are the problems that will keep this from taking place? Isaiah talks about it here in verses 6 and 7. Look at verse 6. But we're all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our problem this morning is that we are corrupted by our sins. Notice what he says here. We're all as an unclean thing. He's including himself in it. He's a prophet. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. What, what he's saying is that your righteousness and my righteousness in the eyes of God is nothing more than, than filthy rags. You find something very interesting if you look up those two words, filthy rags, and what they mean in the Hebrew language. They literally applied to the in infectious, putrid clothing of a leper. Someone who had running sores. Someone had who had oozing sores. And, and their, their, their clothes were just, you, you would never dare even touch those things. And he's, what he's saying is when, when God looks down at us, and if all, all we have on is our own righteousness, there were nothing more than filthy rags in his sight. We're, we're like an we're, we're like oozing sore, a, a corrupt sore in his sight. It's amazing how we have become so skilled in dressing up in our self-righteousness. It is absolutely amazing how we, how we, we have become skilled at making our way to church deceiving ourselves and others. But God says that my righteousness, your righteousness is but a filthy rag in His sight. Sadly, we try to cover ourselves with the very thing that defiles us and condemns us. Not only does He say that our righteousness is like a filthy rag, but He says our righteousness is like a fading leaf. Look on in verse 6. But we all do fade as a leaf. I couldn't believe it when I looked at my calendar this morning, and this is the second day of August. We're, 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 fall is right upon us. Seemed like I got up yesterday morning and, and spring had finally come, and, and, and I've turned around and fall is here. Now, I don't have to tell you what happens to the leaves in fall time. I love the beautiful color of the leaves when they go to turning. I look forward to that. It's picturesque. But I want you to know there's no, there, there's no life in a leaf that is faded. All the life is gone. When the chlorophyll leaves that tree and goes down, that leaf is left as a brown thing, and it won't be long as it flutters in the wind until it'll fall to the ground. There is nothing less appealing than a dried-out, 
crusty Christian with no presence of real life about them. That, that, that is, listen, that, there is nothing in this world that is more offensive that, than a Christian, somebody who professes Christ who has no life of God about them. People are not interested in being around that. Not only have we been corrupted by our sins, but notice secondly here in verse 7, we're complacent in that sin. There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. How long since you stirred yourself to take hold of God? Say, how do I take hold of God? Preacher, I'll tell you how. In the book. Get in the book. Get on your knees. That's how you take hold of God. You want to get to God's presence, you're going to have to lay aside your Facebook and your Twitter and all those other things that you're occupied with. You're going to have to quit being so interested in what Eloise down the road's fixing for supper and be more interested in what God has to say and get into His Word and spend time there with Him. Our problem is we're in our sin and we are complacent in our sin. I see a lot of folks like that. They're, continue, they're, they're contented with coming to church on Sunday morning and warming the little place where they sit in their pew. And that's enough for me. That's enough religion for me. That's all I need. I need no more than that. I wonder, I wonder what we're going to do when the stars start falling out of their socket. I, I wonder what we're going to do when what violence we have seen in the street actually spreads across this country. And I want to tell you this morning, friend, if you think it's going to end in the few cities that it's been in, you're living, you're living a reckless life. It isn't going to end there unless we have revival. I wonder what are we going to do? We're complacent. In our, are we willing to stir ourselves up? What kind of a desire do you have today for revival in your life, in your home? in our church, in our nation. I thought, I was talking to Miss Anna this morning. Our schools are going to start back. And I, 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 I've got to tell you this morning, I shudder for our children. I really do. I, sh I, I have no idea what they're going to be facing. I read in, in the news yesterday where, what was the school in Mississippi opened back up and they've already had to close back down because they had cases test positive. I don't know what's going to happen. I pray God that doesn't happen. But how are you going to equip your kids to go to, go to, to, to the schoolroom? Well, you say they're going to have a mask. They're going to have to have social distancing. Well, some people are doing the best they can with all that and we still got the problem going on. Well, I'm going to give them money for the lunchroom. You know, I'll do my best to get them there. Listen, you can do all that, but I can tell you they're still not equipped to face what's going on in this world unless God is present in their life. Unless you spend time with them praying, preparing them to face whatever is going to come there. Amen. Are you concerned about revival in your home, in your life? Are you concerned about revival in our church? I, I get frustrated myself sometimes. I, I, get, I, I get more concerned sometimes about the physical well-being of things around here than, 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 than I really am about the, the spiritual situation in the church. Listen, we can do without the lights and we can do without the air conditioning. We, we can do without all those things, but we cannot do without God. Not only are we corrupted by our sins, complacent in our sins, but we're consumed by our sin. Look at the last part of verse 7. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed because of our iniquities. What that literally means is that our sins are eating us alive. God has turned His face away. And when the face of God is turned away, our protection is gone. 
there are a lot of problems, and there have been problems in America. There were problems in America the day it became a nation. And there will be problems in America when, when, time, when, when the Lord draws the curtain on this thing. But we have, we have been a blessed nation. Can I get an amen somewhere? We have been a blessed nation. And, and, and don't, don't, you ever, don't you ever sit down and, and let your little pitiful brain convince you that, that the reason we have been protected and blessed as a nation is because of our military or our politics or our economy. I want to tell you why this nation has survived and why it's been blessed. It has been because of the hand of Almighty God. That's why. But because his name has been exalted and uplifted and, and missionaries have been sent around the world to preach the gospel to those who are lost, God has honored this nation. But I want to tell you, friend, we're slowly but surely seeing that protective shield that God has, has over and around America eroded away. And unless somebody really gets serious about the need for God's presence for heaven sent revival. It's not going to be long until what we have seen in some isolated places is going to begin to happen down on the street where you live and where I live. Isaiah tells us about the pro presence that produces revival. He talks about the problems that prevent revival. But then I want you to notice lastly in verses 8 through 12 the prayer that precedes revival. How can we have revival? How do we seek God's face? It all involves the right kind of praying. And in these verses, uh, Isaiah gives to us some essentials of the right kind of praying. What right praying involves. As I, as I read this and was thinking about it, I, I, I thought about the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it was actually a model prayer that he was teaching his disciples. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, after this matter, pray ye our Father which art in heaven. You know what I'm talking about. And if you follow that, the prayer of Isaiah, you, you, you see the Lord's prayer right here. First of all, essential praying recognizes the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 8. Behold, now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We're the clay, and thou our potter, and we're all the work of thy hand. Let me remind you this morning that God isn't interested in a place in your life. God is not even interested in prominence in your life. God demands and God deserves preeminence in your life and in my life. That's what he desires. And the question that, that I need to ask myself, and you need to ask yourself this morning, am I, am, I, am I really willing for that to be so? Could you, would you earnestly pray something like this, God, mold me and make me after thy will? Jesus said to his disciples, you need, you need to pray for the will of the Father. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. As a Christian, if we aren't willing to pray that prayer, then, then we're not surely not in a place to meet God and have God come in our presence. Are there things in your life this morning that you couldn't pray and ask God to bless? I had an old fellow years ago now, <laughs> uh, not long after I started preaching, and he, he came to me, and he, he, God love his heart. He, he, uh, and I'm on meddle, okay? So if you don't want to hear meddling, put your hand, fingers in your ears. Uh, he, he, had a, he had a camel problem. I don't mean a humpback. He had, had, a, had a camel problem that you carry in your, in your pocket. And uh, my boy, the Lord was on his case about it and working on him. And, and uh, the first thing he wanted to know was if, uh, uh, if I smoke cigarettes, am I going to go to hell? Well, cigarettes send me to hell. And I said, no, no, that's a bunch of bunk. I, I'd never get up and tell anybody that smoking a cigarette sends you to hell. may make you smell like you've been there, but it, it ain't going to send you to hell. No, no more than any other sin. You see, my sins and yours were taken care of by the blood of Christ at Calvary. Now, that's not an excuse for me to sin, but the fact is, all of our sins were taken care of there. And, and he said, I'm just struggling with this. I don't know what to do. I said, well, let, try this for a while and see if, see if it helps. I said, the next time you reach and, 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 and get that pack of camels out, 
why don't you just stop and hold that thing in your hand and say, now, uh, my dear Father in heaven, would you bless this cigarette as I partake of it? He said, I can't do that. I said, you mean to tell me you're going to do something you can't ask God to bless? Oh, he said, I wish I hadn't even talked to you. And he stuck it back in his pocket. He went on for a few weeks and uh, we went on visitation on a Thursday night together, my home church. And the first thing I noticed when he got out of the car, when he met me there at the church, he didn't, I mean, he was always visible. He always had that th things in his pocket. Now, I'm just using that as an example this morning to illustrate what I'm talking about. Are there things in your life this morning you can't ask God to bless? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about what we categorize as the big sins, you know, big sins. What, what old John's doing, immorality over there. What old Bill's doing over there. He involved in drinking and alcohol and drugs. The big sins, the big, big sins. I'm not doing that. I'm talking about them. You see, in God's eyes, there's no such thing as little sin and big sin. Sin. I'm talking about those things you know that aren't pleasing to God. Things that you know the Lord is not pleased with. Are you willing to agree with God about those things and allow Him to work in your life? Not, not only does that prayer recognize God's sovereignty, but it remembers God's mercy. Look, look at verse number nine. Be not wroth, be not angry, very sore, O Lord. Neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we're all thy people. Real Bible praying remembers God's mercy and cries out for that. Can I remind you this morning that God wants to extend mercy in my life and in your life? God had much rather forgive our sin than to judge and punish our sin. God finds no pleasure in judging our sin. He wants to forgive our sin. But remember this, God cannot put away sin by forgiving it unless we're willing to forsake it. The only way God's going to put that sin away is when we're, we get a, to a place where we're willing to repent of it, which means turn from it, forsake it in our lives. Let me say that again. God cannot put away our sin by forgiving it unless we put it away by forsaking it. The problem with so many of our prayers is that we aren't willing to really repent in our lives. We want God's mercy, but we want God's mercy according to our wishes and our desires. And I can tell you this morning that repentance and prayer uh, seeking God's mercy without repentance and prayer is a, is a religious farce. We're wasting our time praying if we aren't willing to come clean with God. But then he, he tells us that this kind of praying not only involves recognizing God's sovereignty and His mercy, but respecting His glory. Look, look at verse 10. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise these burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Real praying respects the glory of God. What he's saying here is, O God, we remember the glory. We remember what it was like when you were here among us. We remember when you spake to us from your sacred temple. Our fathers have told us about it. What a glorious time it was. And they were crying out, Oh God, we want your glory again. What they're saying is, God, do it again. Would you please do it again? Show thy face. Show thy glory. Real revival? Preacher, what is real revival? Is it just having an evangelist come and preach? Oh, no, it's a whole lot more than that. Is it just having great evangelistic singing? All oh, that, listen, that can be a great part of it, but it's, it's a whole lot more than that. Real revival is when God shows up, when God comes down. Isaiah tells us about the presence that brings that revival. He talks to us about the problems that prevent that revival. And then he shares with us the prayer that precedes that revival. This morning, we are a people in need, a need that is great, and we're living in an hour that is late. I believe with all of my heart this morning, we're in the twilight hours of this thing. I want to ask you this morning, do you want real revival in your heart? Is that what you desire? Is that what you want in your own heart? Is that what you desire for your family, your children? Maybe you haven't been willing to stir yourself up. Maybe you, maybe you need to come to God and say, God, I, 
I want you to help me to stir myself up. I, I want you to help me to, 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 to get up off the stool of do nothing in this thing and, and get myself where I ought to be. Maybe you're dressed in the rags of your self-righteousness. You've been looking at yourself in your religious mirror. <laughs> and you've been measuring yourself by me. You've got a poor, poor example if you're looking at me, honey. If you, wanna, if, you wanna, if you want an example, I would, I would encourage you to look to Jesus this morning because he's the one that set the pattern. Maybe you're just dressed in your filthy rags this morning. Maybe you're a dying leaf and you don't even know it. Maybe you're satisfied with where you are in your complacency. I want to ask you this morning, what else, what else do you have to see to be convinced that the hour is desperate that we're living in? I said it earlier, and I hope it'll go home with you this morning. One of two things is going to happen in this church. One of two things is going to happen in this community. One of two things is going to happen in this country. We'll either see revival or ruin is just before us. And what I want to tell you this morning is that if you'll seek God, He promised that in His Word. I didn't say that. God said that through His Word. If you'll seek God, His desire is to come down among us. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down. Now hear me. We don't have to persuade God to send revival. We only have to permit Him to send it. You and I hold the key in this thing if we're willing to allow God to do what He wants to do and meet His condition. He is willing to do that. Would you bow your head with me, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. Miss Janet's coming to the piano in just a moment. She'll be playing a verse of an invitation song. How about your family this morning? Where's your family at this morning? How about, how about kids, grandkids? How, how, how are things as you look around this morning? Where, where do you see them? Oh, he said, preacher, things are in a mess. I know they're in a mess. I can't fix them. You surely can't fix them. Somehow that we got the idea that the stock market and money and all those things can fix all the trouble, but it cannot. The only thing that can fix the trouble today is the presence and power of God without Him. He must come down. See, the revival or ruin. I don't know where you are spiritually. I can tell you where I am and where I realize I am this morning. And I know this morning I, I need to take a step toward God this morning or He's never going to take a step toward me. Maybe you need to make that move this morning. Maybe you're here and unsaved. You need to come and trust Christ as your Savior. I beg you to do that this morning. Maybe you're here and you just say, Preacher, my, I know where I'm at this morning. And, and you, you described it. Isaiah described it in the Word right there. I'm as a filthy rag. I'm as a fading leaf. And I, I'm contented. I'm just sitting here in my contentment where I am. And I need to stir myself up that God could come in my life and do what He wants to do. Father, thank You for Your Word. Bless these moments of invitation. Give victory in hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Stand with me, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. You obey the Lord this morning. You do what the Lord tells you to do. I encourage you to come while we wait.